Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown. Welcome to my Think Tech show, which is entitled, How Did We Get Here? And each week that I'm on, I talk about different different stories from Hawaii's past, different stories from Hawaii's history. And I try to not only inform people about them, but also try to bring them to a relevant point today. In other words, why should we be caring about these stories? Well, today I'm going to be talking about a threat, which has been ever present for the Hawaiian Islands and still exists today. And that is tsunamis. What is a tsunami? Well, a tsunami is a series of waves that occur in any body of water when a large amount of water has been displaced. So a tsunami can happen on a very small scale in a pond or a lake. It can happen in a river, but they can also happen in the ocean. And those are the ones that are killers. And those are the ones that are so dangerous. The Hawaiian Islands are located in the center pretty much of the Pacific Ocean. And around the rim of the Pacific Ocean is something called the Pacific Rim of Fire. That is much of the rim of the Pacific Ocean is geologically active. And that means that not only are there volcanoes and active volcanoes, there also are earthquakes. And earthquakes, particularly when they occur underwater, if they are very strong, can displace a large amount of water. And that can cause a tsunami. A tsunami can be generated right here in the Hawaiian Islands, or it can be generated as far away as Japan or South America. And all of those places have caused tsunamis. And all of those tsunamis, or not all of them, but a number of them have been very destructive and have taken many lives. The first slide that you're seeing is an artistic depiction of a tsunami that occurred on the island of Hawaii in 1868. And there was a very large earthquake at that time. It was a seven point something. That's large for us here in the Hawaiian Islands. And it generated a number of, it, it, moved, uh, it moved a lot of land. And in addition to a number of people being killed by a very large landslide, there was also a tsunami that was dead, that was generated right here. And when this tsunami came ashore at a place called Ninole, People were, of course, taken by total surprise because there wasn't a warning system. And one of the people who was swept out to sea by one of the waves is said to have been able to get back to shore by surfing back on another wave. This painting, which is from the 1950s, is a very <laughs> non-realistic depiction of this man surfing back to shore. He did not actually surf as if he was on a surfboard, the way you see him here. And he did not ride a wave that looked like this, because very rarely do tsunami incoming waves look like a regular wind-generated wave. This image, in fact, was copied or inspired by photographs of surfers at Makaha in the 1950s when big wave surfing in Hawaii really began to take off and really began to happen more frequently. And the artist who did this was inspired to create an image like this one, which is very dramatic. Now, this painting does not belong to Bishop Museum, but it was on display here in Bishop Museum, where I work in the archives department from 1958 to 1968. And a lot of people saw it at that time and a lot of people remember it. So while it is not accurate and while it is very dramatized, it is a record of a very damaging earthquake and a very damaging tsunami, which was generated here in the Hawaiian Islands, which is not as common as tsunamis that come from other locations. Well, now we're going to move forward in time, and I'm going to take you through a bunch of pictures showing you the results of some of the tsunamis of the 20th century. So to begin with, here is a 1923 tsunami. Now, when there is a tsunami that affects the Hawaiian Islands, it can take many forms, and it can affect a number of different locations in the islands, depending on where they are, depending on where the tsunami is coming from, depending on how large it is. And 
all these factors make it very difficult to know in advance how a particular tsunami may affect us. Well, this is a picture of Kahului Harbor. And in 1923, there was no tsunami warning system. So nobody knew that this was coming. It happened during the middle of the day, as you can see. And this picture is historically important because it's probably the oldest photo taken here in the Hawaiian Islands of a tsunami actually coming ashore, actually washing ashore. Because again, at this time, there was no warning. So nobody knew this was coming. Now, as I said earlier, a tsunami is a series of waves. So there can be one or two, there can be as many as 10 or more. And in fact, it's only one or two usually in that series that are really significant and very large. But you can never tell which one of the biggest, which one the biggest wave might be. So obviously there was an earlier wave, people were aware that there was a tsunami going on and they were able to watch for subsequent waves. That's why this picture was taken. And it's difficult to tell, but the tsunami in this picture is washing over train tracks. There were trains in a number of places in the Hawaiian Islands in 1923. They were not only an important source of uh, transportation for people, but they were more important for moving goods, moving objects. And this train track is at the harbor at Kahului so that it could help load and unload ships. And the harbor at that time was under reconstruction. They were building a breakwater. They were building another dock. That's why that equipment that you see in the background is there, because they're doing improvements to the harbor. Well, that was Maui. And now here are pictures of Hilo. Hilo, Hawaii is the largest city on the Big Island. It is also the largest city outside of uh, whatever is on Oahu. And Hilo, unfortunately for it, is extremely susceptible to tsunami damage. What you see here are houses, individual wooden houses that have been knocked around, washed off their foundations. And houses, wooden houses in some cases, can survive tsunami waves if they are picked up sort of gently and moved by the water and set back down. But more frequently, wooden houses like these are simply broken apart, smashed to pieces. And if you're inside one of these houses, that can lead to your injury or your death. Here's another photo taken in Hilo in 1923. And you can see that this is the remains of a bridge. And on the left side of the picture, you see a woman standing. She's standing next to railroad tracks that were on this bridge because as I mentioned earlier, there were still functioning railroads at this time. And this was a major railroad bridge that crossed over to in the background in the center, left or right center, that's actually the terminal and the, uh, the place where the trains were kept, what's usually called the roundhouse, for the Hawaii Consolidated Railway. So that's the structure that you see in the background. Now, this particular location was the source of, was the site of the only fatality of this particular tsunami. This is where the fishing sampans were docked and Hilo had a large fishing sampan fleet at the time. It still does have fishing boats. And most of those boats at this point were manned by Japanese people, uh, Japanese men. And one of those fishing boats was being washed out to sea. And the captain of that ship or the owner of that particular boat, fishing sampan, was on it. And when it was smashed into the bridge that is further out, on the left of this photograph, the man was killed. And as he was, as I said, he was the only person killed in this particular disaster. Although, as you can see, there was a certain amount of damage as well. Now we're going to move forward in time to April 1st, 1946. And this was the tsunami that was, was significant in a number of ways. It was generated by an earthquake in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And again, there was no warning system at the time. So the waves came ashore without any warning on that morning. And some people thought because it was April Fool's Day 
that when they were warned by others that people were playing an April Fool's prank. Uh, I don't know that anybody was actually injured or killed because they didn't believe it, but that was part of what is going on on that day. This tsunami was notable because of its widespread effects. Of the historic tsunamis that we know about, this was the one that did the most damage to most islands in the Hawaiian Islands. And here's a photograph taken on the Windward Oahu coast on Oahu after that particular series of waves had come ashore. And you can see that not only is there a house that's been washed off its foundation and is in the background kind of crooked, but you see also this automobile that the guy is sitting on that has been ruined. And there's a wire that is stretched around the back of this automobile that's now destroyed. And I think, I suspect that's probably an electric wire because of course, the electric supply was on poles that were next to the road. Those were knocked down. That means you have no electricity. In the city of Honolulu, this particular tsunami didn't cause a lot of damage. It didn't wash too far ashore. But one notable place that was affected was Ala Moana Park. So here you see vehicles driving through the flood water or the uh, tsunami water from the ocean, which was left on the street that goes through the park. To the right in this photograph is the beach. And you can see there's the um, kind of the arbor or the awning or the pergola structure that's uh, right next to the ocean, right next to the pond, but right next to the beach sand. So you can see that not only is there water still left here, but there's a lot of muck. There's a lot of uh, stuff that's been washed in. But the damage was very minimal. This was not a major disaster here uh, so much in Honolulu. But again, on other parts of the shoreline of Oahu, uh, this is also true of the Lanikai subdivision. There was a lot of damage there. And this is, like we saw earlier, a house that has been picked up washed completely in shore, on shore off of its foundation and dropped back down and deposited on the ground along with this Oldsmobile in the foreground that's been left there as well. And these both have been left in a sugarcane field and they were not there originally. This is when the sugar industry was still thriving. There was a great deal of sugar being grown throughout the Hawaiian Islands and a lot of that sugarcane when it was next to the ocean, was knocked down, flattened, killed by the salt water, and there was also debris deposited in it. Now, I also want to again point out that this all occurred before there was a warning system. Fortunately, let's go to the next picture here. The waves occurred early in the morning. That's good because, one, it wasn't nighttime, so there was no, people were not in the dark, literally trying to figure out what to do, how to evacuate, how to save themselves, because the sun was up. And again, as I said, the electricity, of course, was knocked out in many places, so had it been nighttime, people wouldn't have been able to see. It was also good that it was early morning because most businesses had not opened yet. And that was particularly important in Hilo, which we're looking at here, because downtown Hilo was very badly damaged. And a lot of commercial businesses, most of them stores, were wrecked or very badly ruined. Had those stores, had there been normal amounts of people during the middle of the day where there were shoppers, there were people driving, there were people in their places of business, they would have been injured or killed. Fortunately, most places weren't open yet. So in a sense, the Hawaiian Islands dodged a bullet because it could have been much worse in 1946. But it was bad enough as it was because over 100 people were killed in this disaster. And one of the most uh, tragic locations was the Laupahoehoe Peninsula on Hawaii Island, where the school of that district was located a lot of students were there ready to start their school day, and they were watching the ocean doing strange things. And the teachers also were there because they lived in cottages next to the school. 
the whole Laupohoipohoi Peninsula was swept by waves. The school was destroyed. The teachers' cottages were destroyed and a number of not only the students were killed, but some of the teachers as well. Now, this disaster was very trendsetting because it formed, it was the reason for the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center and system to be set up for the first time because it was possible to monitor earthquakes, and it still is in various places through seismographs. And you can, seismographs can read earthquakes all over the world. So when there was an earthquake in an area that might have generated a tsunami, starting in 1948, for the first time, there were warnings before tsunami came here. And that was gonna make a big difference, but not as much of a difference as it should have, as we will see. The next significant tsunami to strike the Hawaiian Islands came in 1952. And as before, Hilo, the city of Hilo, felt the most damage from this particular event. This was not a really major tsunami. It, uh, was, un it was outdone by others which were going to be coming in the future after this. But still, it caused some significant damage in Hilo. And again, here's like what we've already seen. This is a private home, a wooden home, picked up, broken apart, and then dropped back down and left on the ground in ruins in Hilo. Uh, fortunately, by this time, as I just said, there was a warning. So people did know that a tsunami was coming and many did get out of the way. And this picture is uh, sad for a number of reasons. In the first place, it is obviously during the tsunami event, or you can you can possibly tell that that's going on. There are two police cars here. There are police, uniformed police officers, and there are civilians. This picture was taken on the main street of Hilo, the city of Hilo, Kamehameha Avenue. And this is in the Waiakea district. You can see there's been a little bit of street flooding from the tsunami water coming up through the drains, the street drains, which would, of course, just lead out to the ocean for rainfall to go down to the ocean. Well, in this case, the water came in the opposite direction. But the damage here was very minimal, at least in this particular area. One of the ironies is, and one of the sad things is, that the tsunami that was going to occur eight years later in 1960 would absolutely destroy this area. Every building that you see in this picture would be completely destroyed in 1960. And that is something that we're about to talk about. And here's something else that's also very important for this time period. Even though there were warnings for tsunamis, people were not necessarily taking them seriously because of course, one, there were false alarms, quote unquote, meaning that there was actually a tsunami, but it was very small. So there was no damage. People then said, well, we get these warnings and nothing happens. Why should we pay attention to them? And second, people actually went to the shoreline to look at what was going on. So in this picture, which is again in Waiakea, in Hilo, people are standing around during the series of tsunami waves. And they're watching what's happening. And you can also see there's a guy with a fishing net. He's trying to catch fish that have been brought up onto the street by the waves. Well, this is insane. You're putting yourself in tremendous danger. But the police at that time and the authorities at that time did not strictly keep people away. And that was going to be a problem in the future. One thing that occurred after the 1946 tsunami in Hilo was that it was understood that this tsunamis were a recurring danger and that the city had to adapt to them. So after 1946 and continuing up into the 1950s, the area in the city of Hilo that was Makai of the main street, which is Kamehameha Avenue, was cleared of most of its buildings. Now, many of them had been destroyed by the 1946 tsunami, but 
even the ones who that had survived, for the most part, were removed. And the private property in this area was condemned and it was turned into a park. So this photograph from 1958 shows you to the right this park area and beyond it on the right is the ocean, is Hilo Bay. So after that 1946 experience, the city of Hilo pulled back, left its waterfront, a lot of its waterfront clear and installed parking lots as well, which didn't have any buildings to be destroyed. And the new buildings which were built and things which were uh, reconditioned were now built on the inland side, on the left side of this picture in Hilo. And it was hoped that that park area would be kind of a buffer zone that could absorb tsunami waves coming ashore without them causing damage and without them endangering people. Well, the city of Hilo, like the city of Honolulu in the 1950s, installed parking meters. And here's a picture on the left of a 1955 Chevrolet parked next to a parking meter on Kamehameha Avenue in Hilo in 1956. Parking meters at the time were seen as kind of a sign of being a modern growing city. Um, there's a lot more to that story, but regardless of that, here are the parking meters. And on the right, there is a magazine ad from 1959 from the company that installed the parking meters in Hilo, bragging about how in the Hawaiian Islands, most of the parking meters came from this particular company. Well, those parking meters were going to become iconic after the 1960 tsunami. And this was actually in the city of Hilo, even worse than 1946. So within this 14 year span, Hilo had been badly damaged twice by severe tsunamis. Look at those parking meters along Kamehameha Avenue. They have been bent almost flat by the force of that incoming tsunami wave. And in this particular location, location where this photograph was taken, the wave was estimated to have been about 30 feet high. And that means this churning mass of water blasted ashore at a height of 30 feet. Hilo was absolutely knocked down flat. Uh, again, you can look at, you can see that from this photograph how strong this whole thing was. In the background is the Hilo Theater. And it had been opened in 1940. It was kept going even after some tsunami damage. But after this wave, it never reopened. And it has long since been destroyed. And today, there are no buildings at all here in this area of Hilo. So here again is Kamehameha Avenue after this wave. Now, there was a warning before this wave came. There was a warning hours earlier. This wave was generated by, or this event was generated by the largest earthquake in recorded history, which was a 9.5 earthquake uh, off the coast of Chile in South America. And that caused an immense tsunami that traveled all the way across the Pacific to kill people as far away as Japan. In this particular event, the damage elsewhere in the Hawaiian Islands was minimal, but here in Hilo, it was catastrophic. And even though there had been a warning hours before this wave came ashore, 61 people still were killed. Why did that happen? Well, for one thing, some people didn't evacuate because previous tsunamis had not affected where they were. Some people didn't leave because, as I said earlier, they said, oh, this is just another one of those false alarms. We don't have to go anywhere. But also, as I showed you in 1952, people actually went to the shoreline to watch. And when the biggest wave came ashore, just after 1 a.m., some of them could not get away. And the police, again, at that time, did not strictly enforce keeping people out of the danger area. Well, what you see in this picture is some uh, cement buildings, concrete buildings, which remain standing, even though they've been completely gutted. And look at the size of that rock that is deposited 
right in the middle of the main street of Hilo. Think of the power of the water to do that. These two pictures are a really graphic demonstration of what happened to Hilo in 1960. On the left, this is the intersection of Mamo Street, which we're looking up in the center, seen from Kamehameha Avenue. You can see between the picture on the left, which was taken in February of 1960, and the picture on the right, which was taken on May 23rd, 1960, hours after that huge wave had come ashore. Look at the difference. This is the same location. Most of the buildings are completely gone. And anybody in those buildings was injured or killed. Now you can see on the right, a white building with debris pushed up against it. In the picture on the left, that white building is about halfway up the block on the right side of the street. And everything around it is gone. So Hilo was now faced with, again, another major disaster, many more dead people, only 14 years after a previous disaster of equal or similar magnitude. And it was understood that they needed to do something to deal with this threat. So there were two options at the time. The first under consideration was to build a massive concrete seawall that theoretically would be tall enough to keep tsunami waves from coming ashore. And in fact, that's been done a great deal in Japan. The federal government in Japan has built a great many walls like that in shoreline uh, places where particularly where there's a fishing industry and people need to be able to come and go from the docks because that's their livelihood. But they're also trying to keep the waves from destroying everything inland. Hilo decided not to do that, or it was decided in Hilo not to try to build a huge wall. The other option was to simply get out of the way. And that's what they chose to do. So the areas that had been badly damaged or washed over in 1946 and 1960, for the most part, were cleared of all buildings. Not all of them, because some couldn't be moved. But most private property in this area was condemned. The government paid for it. And the owners received financial compensation, but they had to simply find another place either to live or to build their businesses. And the end result of that was something I'm about to show you. But I do, before I need to show you that, show you this picture of Hilo in 1960. And again, this is the area badly decimated, washed clear of most of the buildings. And that little guy standing next to that destroyed car that had been obviously washed over itself again and again and bounced along, that little guy is six-year-old DeSoto Brown. That's me in Hilo. And my family went to visit after this tsunami disaster to see what had happened. And even at the age of six, I remember being shocked that large areas of large buildings were completely gone. And it made an impression. And that's why I've been interested in tsunamis ever since. And that's why I'm talking to you today, many decades later, as an old man with a gray beard, about what happened in 1960. And this is the end result of what Hilo chose to do. In this aerial photograph taken in the 1970s of Hilo, you can see on the right in the center, a large green open space. That is the area that had formerly been completely urbanized, had been completely filled with buildings that was kept clear. This is the intentionally cleared area. The area towards us in the foreground does not receive as much wave damage as the area in the center of the bay. And that's why that player, that's why this area is completely clear and it's all green. This is all parkland. And not only does this parkland serve as a as sports fields, and there are a lot of sporting events that go on there, 
but also it's an open space for people to enjoy. It also serves as a runoff area of sort of a catchment area for rain. Hilo gets a great deal of rain. This area of the big island of Hawaii gets a lot of rain, and that leads to flooding. Now, the floodwaters simply are sort of congregated in this open space so that they do very little damage. They are an inconvenience, but for the most part, nobody's displaced, nobody's building is destroyed, nobody's property is wrecked. So the end result of stepping back and getting out of the way of water is what you see here in Hilo. And this is a very important point for us to consider right now because ocean levels are rising. We are going to have to deal with that along all of our shorelines. It is not possible to keep the ocean from rising. It is not possible for that water to come on shore. What are we going to do about it? This is what Hilo did about it. Keep this in mind as we continue into the future, a future where we have to get out of the way of the water. Another thing that was done in Hilo was not only clearing all that land, but was also constructing landfill to raise the area, to raise the ground level so that this raised area would be far less likely to be inundated by tsunami waves. And that, what you're looking at here, is this raised area. And it is called the Kaiko'o District or the Kaiko'o Redevelopment Area. And in the 1970s, starting in the late 60s and then into the 70s, the Kaiko'o Redevelopment Area was built upon a great deal, as you see here. So not only were government buildings built there, a hotel was built there, which is now just a condominium, and also a shopping center, an enclosed mall called the Kaiko, the Kaiko Mall. That's what you see in the left center of this photograph. Now, unfortunately, as with many downtown areas, downtown Hilo, some parts of it have economically contracted. The Kaiko Mall is mostly unoccupied today, but this area was successfully rebuilt. Certainly the, the, the government buildings are still in use in hopes of raising it above future tsunami inundation. And this is also something that was done in Japan after the 2011 tsunami there. Cities and towns that were badly damaged and already had tsunami walls simply had to pull back and retreat from the shoreline and there was also, as you see here, landfill in some areas to also raise the land again, hopefully to avoid flooding damage. Now, in the years since 1960, since the tsunamis that I've shown you, interestingly, the Hawaiian Islands have not undergone another major tsunami disaster. There have been tsunamis and there has been damage, but it has not been catastrophic. But here's a, here's a tsunami inundation map showing Honolulu and Waikiki, and this dates from 1969. Now, this is based on historically what historic records showed as the places that were in danger of tsunamis. And this was also how things were done in Japan. Japan also had historic records of where areas had been damaged by tsunamis, and they used those records to determine how they could make themselves safe with these seawalls that I was talking about. Unfortunately, in 2011, Japan underwent, underwent the largest earthquake in its recorded history. It was over nine magnitude. That caused the largest tsunami ever recorded in Japan, which can far more inland than anybody could have anticipated that it could. And even with warning, even with the best warning system in the world, even with the best educated populace in the world about what to do in the case of a tsunami, 20,000 people were still killed there. Well, this and the 2004 tsunami that killed over 200,000 people 
in the Indian Ocean made people here rethink what our tsunami maps should look like. And look at the difference between this map and this one. This is the map that is currently in use for tsunami evacuation zones. And it got it has two different zones. The green colored area is considered safe, but you'll notice there's a yellow area and a red area. The red area is the area which is pretty much sure to be inundated. Not sure, but this is based on historical records. This is the area likely to be damaged and that you need to evacuate from. But after those two catastrophes that I just mentioned, 2004 and 2011, the inundation maps have been dramatically increased. And so the yellow area now shows what would happen in an extreme tsunami. And we know that those can happen. They have happened. We know that if they do happen, and we are the unfortunate target of a, such an event, we need to evacuate far further than we used to think. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the red area of this map, right along the shoreline, that's the area that we have to think about dealing with sea level rise. Regardless of tsunamis, the water is going to be coming up anyway. And that also does mean, by the way, that tsunamis will go further inland as the ocean levels rise. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind what Hilo did. Can we do that in Honolulu? Can we do that in Waikiki? It's another huge topic I'm not going to get into now. And finally, these new tsunami uh, evacuation signs have been installed throughout Honolulu in the last year or so. So 2023, 2024. And these show those new inundation zone areas. So this is a way to get people to be more aware of the increased danger that we're now aware of for tsunamis and to be aware that the area that they have to evacuate can be bigger than they thought. So tsunamis are never going to go away. The earth is never not going to be undergoing what to us are natural disasters. The more we know about them, the more we can prepare for them. And the less damage and the less injuries and the fewer deaths that we'll undergo. Thank you for joining me. I'm DeSoto Brown. I am here on Think Tech with my show, How Did We Get Here? And I hope you'll be joining me in the future for more shows just like this one. Until I see you again, aloha.